Welcome to the DaVinci Academy Histology video course. The entire video course is available on YouTube and covers all of the fundamental principles of histology and relevant cell biology. You can find all of the videos from the course by clicking the histology playlist link in the description below, and then you can access the corresponding practice questions and histology lab videos by going to our website, which is also linked in the description below. Hello and welcome back. In the second of the three neurohistology video series, we'll discuss the glial cells in the CNS and in the PNS. Neuroglia refers to the collections of stromal cells within the neural tissues. As a reminder, neural tissues are quite unique in that within the neural tissue proper, there are no extracellular fibers, but instead it's the projections from the stromal cells as well as the neurons themselves that form the fibrous networks or the stromal component of the neural tissues. The neuroglial cells that are in the central nervous system and those in the peripheral nervous system are quite different. So we'll start looking at the stromal cells in the central nervous system first. Here's a lovely diagram of the central nervous system neurohistology. We can appreciate the neuron, the multipolar neurons, a few of them anyway, that are traversing through this field. And the four types of stromal cells within the central nervous system are highlighted here as well. Astrocytes are characterized by a number of these cellular projections that go out of the main cell body. And many of these cellular projections will end in these dilations called end foot plates which kind of look like the ends of the stethoscopes, and rightfully so, because astrocytes are constantly monitoring how the different regions of the neurons are doing and regulating its microenvironment. The astrocytes also play an important role in the maintenance of the blood-brain barrier. Neural tissues are actually highly vascular with lots of capillary networks that are traversing through. The endothelial cells of these capillaries, however, have pretty amazing amount of tight junctions in between the endothelial cells, which really tightly regulates what goes in and out of the neural tissue. On top of that, some of these astrocyte foot plates will come in and form somewhat of a secondary barrier, if you will, thereby regulating and influencing how the endothelial cells function. So structurally speaking, the blood-brain barrier, which I'll call BBB, has the endothelial cell tight junctions, plus of course there will be the basement membrane, plus the astrocyte end foot plates that contribute to the tightly regulated communication and transport between the blood and the neural tissue. Another class of stromal cells in the neural tissues are the oligodendrocytes. Within the central nervous system, it's the oligodendrocytes that are responsible for myelinating the axon fibers. What's unique here is the fact that oligodendrocytes can myelinate more than one segment of different axons by sending out multiple projections, each of which then wrap around themselves around a region of the axon which is quite different from the stromal cells in the PNS called the Schwann cells that myelinate axons, where the entire cell wraps itself around a segment of the axon. Again, that is in the PNS. More on that later. Another type of stromal cells in the CNS are the microglial cells, or also known as the microglia. The microglial cells are these cells with numerous dendritic processes that extend out of the cell body. And these microglial cells are actually derived from the hematopoietic origin. These are the resident macrophages in the CNS. And lastly, ependymal cells are the cells that line the CNS-filled ventricles as well as lining the outsides of the choroid plexus which produce the cerebrospinal fluid. So looking at these stromal cells within a neurohistology like this, we can once again easily recognize the neurons by their large cell body and perhaps number of projections that are coming off of them. Now looking at these smaller nuclei a little closer, we can actually identify the nuclei of the astrocytes, oligodendrocytes, as well as the microglial cells. The astrocyte nuclei are characterized by a bit, a slightly larger size and a good mixture of euchromatin and 
and heterochromatin. So these are good examples of astrocyte nuclei. And this mixture of euchromatin and heterochromatin within the astrocytes are sometimes described as salt and pepper. Now that I've pointed out about four astrocytes in this field, see if you can identify some additional astrocytes. I hope your eyes are going to something like these, as well as these. Lots and lots of astrocytes. In fact, astrocytes are the most numerous cells within the CNS. And while we can easily identify the nuclear features of astrocytes, we cannot trace the outer boundaries of the astrocyte cell membrane. And that's because of the highly branching nature of the astrocytes, which make it next to impossible to resolve such tiny membrane features with regular microscopy. Same principle applies to the oligodendrocytes as well as the microglia. We can recognize the nuclear features, but will not be able to trace the outer boundaries of these cells. As for the nuclear feature of the oligodendrocytes, we can recognize them by the smaller sized nuclei that are a lot more heterochromatic. So something like these would be good examples of oligodendrocytes, much more punctate, smaller nuclei than those of the astrocytes. And once again, now that I've pointed out a few, see if you can identify the oligodendrocyte nuclei in this field. And hopefully your eyes all went to these dense and punctate circles that are all oligodendrocytes. Now, the microglia are not quite as numerous within the CNS as there are astrocytes and oligodendrocytes. The microglia can be recognized by their spindly and flattened nuclei that often occur in a solitary fashion. So in this field, something like this would be a microglial cell nucleus. Can you identify some additional microglia? Something like this, this, and this might be microglial cell nuclei. A note of caution, however, if your eyes went to something like these, because I, I see a few flattened cell lining this little space. Now, these flattened nuclei actually belong to the endothelial cells that are lining this vascular space. So this is a capillary lined by the endothelial cells themselves. And lastly, the ependymal cells are these cuboidal looking cells that are lining the ventricular spaces of the central nervous system, which is filled with the cerebrospinal fluid, or CSF. Don't be fooled though, the ependymal cells may resemble an epithelial tissue, but this is not the case since there's no basement membrane that is separating the ependymal cells from the neural tissues underneath. Another area you might see the ependymal cells would be the lining of the coral plexus, which are these cauliflower-shaped complex projections that are found within the ventricular space. The loose connective tissue core of the choroid plexus contain a lot of capillary networks, which actually lack the blood-brain barrier, which allows the ependymal cells to then filter the blood in order to generate the cerebrospinal fluid. Now let's look at the stromal cells in the peripheral nervous system, or the PNS. The most prominent type of stromal cells in the PNS are the Schwann cells. In this diagram, we're looking at a neuron in kind of neon green with the neuron cell body and dendrites in some distant region and an axon that is radiating out into the peripheral nervous system. And what is myelinating? The portion of the axon that is traveling within the PNS are the Schwann cells which take all of its cytoplasm and its cell membrane and wrap themselves around a portion or segment of the axon thereby insulating that region of the axon with all of its cytoplasm and repeating layers of membranes. So while the myelinating cells in the CNS are the oligodendrocytes, the Schwann cells do the same job in the PNS. The only difference here is that in the PNS, the Schwann cells use all of its cell body and its membranes to myelinate a small segment of the axon, whereas in the CNS, the oligodendrocytes can myelinate many sections of several axons at the same time. Other than that, the nodes of RANVA are still present in between the Schwann cells in the PNS, where there's concentration of sodium ions 
that play a role in depolarization of the membranes at the nodes, RANVA. Another type of stromal cells in the PNS are the satellite cells. The satellite cells are actually found in specialized regions of the PNS called the ganglia, where the cell bodies of the neurons that reside outside of the CNS are concentrated. And it's the jobs of the satellite cells to insulate the cell bodies of such PNS neurons and to regulate their microenvironments. We'll look at their histology in the next slide. First, let's look at the Schwann cells. This is a longitudinal section through a nerve where we are seeing tiny little exons that are traveling in parallel orientation to each other. And what is wrapping segments of these exons are the Schwann cells. And because they are rich with the phospholipid bilayers of the cell membrane that's been repeatedly wrapped around the exon, that contributes to these pale staining clearing, if you will, around the exon in the center. Another Thing that's really unique here is that we're actually able to see a small section between one Schwann cell wrapping and another. So this would be the node of RANBA, which is really tiny. Here's another node of RANBA right there. Here's another node of RANBA between one Schwann cell wrapping and the other. And here's another example. These flattened nuclei that are found within this longitudinal sections most likely belong to the Schwann cells and much of the organelles of the Schwann cells including the nuclei are pushed to the periphery of these wrappings. And here's an example of a ganglion which contains a lot of these large and oval cell bodies of the neurons. And what's surrounding each neuron cell body are these tiny spherical to oval cells. And these are the satellite cells that tend to form a nice little barrier between the neuron cell body and extracellular environment. In the nearby region, we're also still able to identify some exon fibers that are also myelinated by lovely Schwann cell wrappings with perhaps an, a node of RANVA right there. We're also able to identify a lovely capillary right here that is lined by an endothelial cell. And here's another example of a vasculature that traverses through the neural structures. Thank you for watching this video from the Da Vinci Academy Histology video course, which is completely available on YouTube. To access the corresponding practice questions and histology lab videos, go to our website using the link in the description below.